بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والعاقبة للمتقين ولا عدوان إلا على الظالمين وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله إله الأولين والآخرين وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله عليه أفضل الصلاة وتم التسليم يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن إلا وأنتم مسلمون يا أيها الناس اتقوا ربكم الذي خلقكم من نفس واحدة وخلق منها زوجها وبث منهما رجالا كثيرا ونساء واتقوا الله الذي تساءلون به والأرحام إن الله كان عليكم رقيبا يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله وقولوا قولا سديدا يصلح لكم أعمالكم ويغفر لكم ظنوبكم ومن يطع الله ورسوله فقد فاز فوزا عظيما وبعد فإن أصدق الحديث كتاب الله تعالى وخير الهدى هدي محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وشر الأمور محدثاتها وكل محدثة بدعة وكل بدعة ضلالة وكل ضلالة في النار My respected brothers and sisters in Islam today we, ha- we have with us a very very beautiful and important topic and that is the history of Andalus and we will inshallah be talking about it in two parts the first lecture inshallah will be on the rise of Andalus and the second one will be about the, about the fall of Andalus now people say when Muslimin talk about Andalus they are crying over spilt milk but wallahi we don't want to cry over spilt milk rather we want to discuss Andalus we want to discuss, discuss the history of Andalus in an intellectual manner we want to discuss it trying to find out what went wrong trying to find out how we took it over and what went wrong and how we lost the greatest city that the world has ever seen on the face of this earth. How did we lose uh, 700 libraries of Islamic books? How did we lose a mosque in which 12,000 circles were given at a single time? 12,000 durus was given at a single time, subhanAllah. How could we ever have lost this? How could we lose pastures of green? How could we lose uh, uh, jannat, you know, uh, uh, gardens which were called jannat because of its vastness, through which rivers flow, through which they built artificial uh, 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 waterfalls, subhanAllah. Such was the, was the grandeur of Spain. How could we have lost the greatest city that this world has ever seen? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in the Qur'an فَقَصُصِ الْقَصَصَ لَعَلَّهُمْ يَتَفَكَّرُونَ So relate to them the stories, perhaps that they may think about it. Relate to them the stories of the past, the things that have gone past, perhaps that we may draw some conclusion, some, some lesson from that. Also Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Qur'an لَقَدْ كَانَ فِي قَصَصِهِمْ عِبْرَةً لِأُولِي الْأَلْبَابِ Verily, in their, in their stories is a message for you. Is a, is a message for you, O people of understanding, to think about. Think about how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's sunnah is always, always come into effect. Think about how Allah's adab comes into effect for those who deserve it. And think about how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's great, great, great blessing comes into effect for those who deserve it as well. From the benefits of learning about history, brothers and sisters in Islam, without doubt is first of all understanding the sunnah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that is to understand how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala works. What causes Allah to get angry? What causes Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's uh, mercy? What brings about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's wrath? And what causes uh, 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 Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's great pleasure? What is it that Muslimin have always done in their life and in their history that has caused the downfall of the Muslimin? And what is it that the Muslims have done? What little is it that the Muslims have done that have been the reason for their great great glory and truly in the history of Spain we have a perfect example why because the history of Spain brothers brothers and sisters in Islam and of course it is uh, it is mashallah what is that brother <laughs> okay obviously not not uh, not from Spain is it okay um, truly in uh, it is a matter which is uh, uh, a, a very pitiful matter. It is a, a, a thing of, of great pity that Muslimin have forgotten the history of Spain. And if you think about it, the history of Spain is two thirds of the Muslim history. Is two thirds of Muslim history. Eight hundred and five years of Muslim history. How can we overlook the history of Spain? Eight hundred and five years of Muslim civilization. Eight hundred and five years of teaching the world the knowledge that it, that, that it now uses to attack us. 805 years to, to advance every single branch of science. SubhanAllah, nowadays we find in, in, in a Western world uh, leading us in certain fields. Wallahi, the Muslimin 
in their time, they used to lead the, used to lead Europe in every single branch of science that you can think of. Until even the kings and queens of Europe used to vie with one another to learn Arabic. Until they used to open their suffers, you know their suffers, their, their dinners, and, and give thanks to their God in Arabic. And they used to open their, their, their dinners with khutbat al haja With khutbat al haja this is the glory of, 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 of Islam that had, had reached the hearts of the people. Until the Jews, until the Zionists, the, uh, the Jews at that time, also learned Arabic, and they actually advanced Judaism through Arabic. And the greatest of the books of the Jews are written in Arabic as well. And until the Jews themselves used to say that, uh, that the Arabic is the best and the most richest language in the world, and how the tables have turned. Nowadays when you go to Saudi Arabia, when you go to the streets of Jeddah, people uh, uh, think of it as a great pride that they know how to speak English. And they try and speak a little bit of English to you, thinking that, mashallah, wow, I know a Western language, and they are so happy. Whereas, knowing Arabic was a, was a, was a thing of pride amongst the kings and queens of Europe, subhanAllah. <clears throat> My brothers and sisters in Islam, I'm sure you agree that 805 years is a tremendous time in which to uh, realize all the sunnah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Verily, when you read the history of Spain and, and the history of Muslims in Spain, you find that all of the sunnah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and all of the sunnah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in, in all its types and all its effects are found in Spain. So we find in, in, in Spain the stories of great heroes and we find in, sto in, in Spain the story of great cowards. We find in Spain the story of great kings and we find in Spain the story of great beggars. We find in Spain the history of great and righteous and pious people and we find in Spain the stories of those people who were overtaken by the fitna of women and all they wrote were copious amounts of books and books about fantasies about women how they uh, and, and they and this is how we find subhanallah the pious and we find the not so pious and so in Spain we find a complete history a complete book for all of us uh, to go through and it is a pity that today we Muslimin don't read history we don't learn from the past because brothers and sisters in Islam I'm sure you agree when you read about history it is as if you are looking into the future it is as if you are looking into the future because that which has come in the past will happen again you know the past re repeats itself as the people say and so when we read about Spain Wallahi it is as if we are reading about our day-to-day -day events it is as if we are <clears throat> reading about our day-to-day -day events do you know that the massacre that happened in, in Bosnia about 10 years ago about uh, what was that uh, 12 years ago now or, or more than that, about 12 years ago, there was an example of that of, of, of something similar that happened in uh, the same area of, uh, of, of Sarajevo. In the same place, the same massacre happened in the time of, uh, of, uh, of, of the Muslim rule in Spain, wherein 70,000 Muslims were killed, 40,000 women raped, subhanAllah. Were we to read history, wallahi, we could save ourselves from falling into the same traps. But unfortunately, Muslimin have forgotten the history. We all say, MashaAllah, we are great and we are truly great. And Muslims were truly great. However, however, we, for, we forget the specific examples of how great we truly were and read about history so that, you know, unfortunately, we end up falling into it. That's why we find people not even, uh, uh, you know, when I ask people, do you know about the Battle of Barket? Do you know about the Battle of Dariya? No, you know, people look at me with a blank face because they don't know. Uh, uh, the history of of, uh, of Spain. We, 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 when I asked them about, do you know about the story of Tariq bin Ziyad destroying the ship, his ships? People look at me with a blank face. Do you, when I asked them as well, do you know about Abdul Rahman al dakhil about which the scholars of Islam have said that were it not to be after Allah for this man, then Spain would have been wiped out. Islam in Europe would have been wiped out for a long, long time. You know, a, a long time ago, before its time, which is in the in the year 897 after Hijra. Do you know about Abdul Rahman al Nasr, who the historians, all of the historians, the Orientalists, the Muslim uh, historians, all of them, all agree that he was the greatest ruler of this earth at that time. The greatest ruler of this earth at that time, and his city was the greatest of cities. We're talking about Qurtuba, uh, it was the greatest of the cities in all of the world at that time. Nothing on this earth could ever match that city and that king in his uh, in his greatness. <clears throat> 
What about Yusuf ibn, ibn, ibn al-Ashbil? As, as the ulama have said, he is one of the most righteous and pious mujahideen of, uh, of Spain. And what about Abu Bakr ibn Umar al-Lantuni? Abu Bakr ibn Umar al-Lantuni, wallahi subhanallah, he was a, uh, an amazing mujahid. Fifteen countries in Africa he brought Islam to. Fifteen of the country's brothers who are Muslims from, a- from Africa owe the Islam to this man, Abu Bakr ibn Muhammad al-Lantuni. Al-Lantuni, wallahi, we have forgotten this great mujahid and this great pious imam. Also, what about Abi Yusuf Yaqub al-Mansur al-Marini? One of the greatest scholars of, of this religion. One of, subhanAllah, we will be going through uh, uh, Abi Yusuf Yaqub ibn, ibn Mansur al-Marini's uh, life today, inshallah, in the second session. And we'll be mentioning how this man singly, single-handedly was responsible for fending off the Christian onslaught for 200 years. For 200 years, this man was responsible and, and the action that he did was responsible for, for saving Spain for 200 years. And how this man single-handedly saved the Turath of, of Islam, the literature of Islam, the history, the, the heritage of Islam by fighting the Christians for only one reason. What was his reason? In order to give back the Muslim books that they had with them. This is the reason why he fought them. <coughs> So that they could give back what? The books of Muslimin that they had taken, the books of the scholars that they had stolen when they were attacking the Muslim lands. Also what about, uh, when we talk about for example Masjid al-Qurtuba, which was the largest mosque ever at that time. The grandest and the largest mosque with 12,000 circles at that time. Each circle having an alim, 12,000 alim with every circle on the, on the head of every circle. And every, every alim had students with him. SubhanAllah, imagine that, imagine 12,000 circles at a given time. Wallahi, in this mosque of ours, we only have one lesson. And if we had two lessons at the same time, people would get angry. What is that man doing? Why are they, why are they giving lessons? SubhanAllah. But th- those people, they were so busy, so busy gaining knowledge, knowing that knowledge is power. Knowing that knowledge is power, they were so busy gaining knowledge in all different fields, 12,000 different circles of knowledge. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. And in, 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 in Andalus uh, and, and in Qurtuba by itself, 700 libraries. 700 libraries. Go to any Muslim land now. How many libraries are there? Public libraries. Tell me. These are public libraries. You could borrow books there. And <laughs> this, is, this is subhanallah. You could borrow books. This is Muslim invention. Europe never knew about these things. There were no public libraries at that time. 700 public, public libraries, how did that happen? How were Muslims so forward thinking that they had 700 public libraries in one city? One city, subhanAllah, perhaps even more than London, I don't know. Perhaps even more than London, but each library had more than a, more than a million titles. More than a million titles, imagine that. Imagine how they were so much into gaining knowledge, so much into gaining knowledge. The question, brothers and sisters in Islam, needs to be asked. Why was there a need to open up Andalus? Why did the Muslimin open up Andalus? What was the need for that? Well, once when the Muslims were attacking parts of, of the Roman Empire in Sham, uh, Mu'adh al Jabal was asked by the Roman uh, uh, leader at that time, the, the Roman general, the same question. Why have you come to attack us? Why don't you just go and attack Ethiopia? which is easier upon you. Why don't you go and attack Ethiopia? Why do you come and attack us? We are the Romans, we are strongest, we're one of the strongest nations on this earth. Why do you Arabs, you filthy Arabs coming from the desert with disheveled hair and, and blunt swords and everything, why do you come and attack us? And Mu'adh ibn Jabal, the faqih of this ummah, said that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in the Quran, وَقَاتِلُوا الَّذِينَ يَلُونَكُمْ مِنَ الْكُفَّارِ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, and fight those who are next to you amongst the disbelievers. Meaning that, meaning that the way the uh, uh, conquest of, of, of Islam or the da'wah of Islam should happen is that da'wah should be proposed or jihad should be proposed to the neighboring cities before any, anyone else. So because you are neighboring to us, so we start with you. Yeah, they didn't care. <laughs> You're the greatest city or not. Wallahi, we don't care. No, we have absolutely no care in the world. You are the strongest, but Allah is stronger. You have a great army, but the armies of all Allah are greater. Subhanallah. We don't care. Allah says in the Quran, we start, you know, we start off with, the, with your neighbors, so we start off with you. And this is the same reason why the Muslims started off with Andalus. Because at that time, the Muslims had reached all the way up until Maghrib. So they had taken all of North Africa, which was Egypt, and then uh, Algeria, and Tunisia, 
and uh, what else is there, and, and, uh, and Morocco. And so they had pushed all the way up until the end of Morocco, until the edge of the, of the ocean, until it has even been reported that Musa, uh, 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 Musa ibn Nusayr, <coughs> who was the leader uh, uh, at that time from the Tabi'een, who was a Mujahid at that time, who opened up all these lands, he even went up to the, to the Pacific Ocean, to the Atlantic Ocean at that, on, on, the, on that edge, to the Atlantic Ocean with his horse halfway, you know, uh, uh, until his horse was, was, was almost submerged. And he said, Wallahi, if it was not for this ocean, I would have taken, was, if it was not for this ocean and, uh, and my horse drowning, I would have taken Islam to the ends of this earth. I would have taken Islam to the ends of this earth. Musa ibn Nusayr, his father was Nusayr. And his father and Ibn Sirin and, and, and Sirin, his father and Sirin were two uh, children who were growing up in the monasteries of, uh, of, of the Christians when Khalid bin Walid opened up Hira. So in Hira they found that there was a city in which there was a monastery, Christian monastery, and in them were two children learning the Torah and learning the Old and New Testaments. And these were Nusair and Sirin. So Khalid bin Walid, he, he told them to accept Islam and they accepted Islam. So from Nusair came Muhammad, the son, Muhammad bin Nusair. And from Sirin came also Muhammad, Muhammad bin Sirin. As everyone knows about Muhammad bin Sirin, who was one of the Tabi'een at that time. So Muhammad bin Sirin, he went to Kufa and he stayed there his life. Whereas Musa bin Nusayr, he raised up, he was raised up with Walid, who was the Khalifa, who was the son of the Khalifa at that time. So when the, when the Khalifa died, Walid became the Khalifa of that of the Muslimin at that time. Of, obviously, that was the Umayyad Empire or, uh, Empire at that time. He became the Khalifa, and Walid made his best friend Musa his general, his first general. And so Musa was sent to North Africa in order to quell the Berbers that were, that were there at that time. Musa took seven years to conquer North Africa. Whereas, of course, before that, North Africa had already been, been conquered. However, the people were always rebellious, and they would go back. They would, they, they would, they would make a pact with Muslimin, and then they would go back. And so Musa ibn Nusayr, he followed the following way. He followed the following, following methodology. He would take up land slowly, slowly. And as soon as he had taken up a city or a land, he would bring scholars, the tabi'een, and put them there. So the people would learn about religion, and then love the, love the religion until the people themselves would be the army that would go on and fight the next lands. And in this way he conquered North Africa in seven years. In seven years. And so the Berbers who were known to be ferocious fighters at that time became from the enemies of Islam to the helpers of Islam. The Berbers were not as people think that they were dark skinned and, and, and black haired and all that. No, they were, they were white skinned, blonde hair, blue eyes. They were blonde hair, <laughs> blonde hair, white skin and blue eyes. And this was how the Berbers were. And they became the great army which will, which will soon conquer Andalus. So Musa started to think in the, year, in the years before the conquest of Andalus. So that is before the year 992 after Hijra. Before that, he started to think where, where does he want to go? If he, went to go, if he, if he goes south, and that is Sahara Desert. And there is no benefit in that because they're not, in, in, they're not, they're not after land. What are they after? They're after Sukkan, they're after the people, they want to teach the people about Islam. Right? And so Musa ibn Nusayr, he decided to go up, and of course up is only, is only Andalus at, the, at that time. Brothers and sisters in Islam, uh, before I go into why, why and, and, and how uh, Musa ibn Nusayr attacked uh, Andalus and how he opened up Andalus, I wanted to mention something very important, that is uh, the, the misunderstanding of people about Jihad. And you see, first of all, Jihad is not as people say peace and harmony and sincerity and this and that. It's just all about peace. No, Jihad is of two types. There is a Jihad of our Difa, which is the, the, the defensive Jihad, which, which every uh, logical person on this earth, every person of, 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 of logic would already agree that there is, that there is a, the Jihad of Difa, which is defending yourselves. You know, it's logical. When, when someone tries to fight, you fight him back. When someone wants to fight, you defend yourself. And this is logical, isn't it? And this is the, the, the jihad of difa. Whereas at that time, it was jihad al dafa which is actually jihad al da'wah as they call it. Which means that the people would try and go to different lands in order to preach Islam to the, to the people. And spread Islam. However, because the kings at that, at, in those lands knew that if people became Muslimin, that they would lose their power. So they were always haughty and proud, and they would always fight the Muslimin. And so, the Muslims got together their armies and they would always seek new lands in order to actually spread Islam. Yeah. In the same way, in this way, by Jihad al-Dafa, by, by Jihad al-Talab, by asking for the, 
for, 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 the, for the war to happen, by, uh, by, by them trying to spread Islam. Islam spread to most of Sham, for example, that, that is parts of Turkey, uh, Lebanon, Jordan, uh, Syria. They were all opened up, not by good manners, brothers and sisters in Islam, they were opened up by the sword. And you have most of Africa, 15 nations, all of the nations of, of Africa, all of the nations that were ever opened up, were opened up with the sword. And then Eastern Europe, they were opened up with the sword. And also uh, parts, parts of Western Europe, wherever the Muslims were, such as Greece, such as Malta, such as Cyprus. Yes, they, were, they used to be Muslim lands at one time. At one time, for centuries, Islam ruled there. Greece, Malta, uh, Yugoslavia, Cyprus, these were all Muslim lands. And, uh, and, and subhanAllah, you, uh, Islam was a, was a predominant religion at that time. They were all opened up with the sword. So sometimes we talk about Malaysia and Indonesia and how they were opened up because of good manners of the Tujjar. However, this is not the case as far as most of the Muslim lands were concerned. Most of the Muslim lands were, concur were, were, were conquered with, with jihad. And as you, as you know, the modernists these days, those who try to apologize for Islam on behalf of Islam, they try and make apologies. They say, no, Islam, has, Islam was not spread by the sword. Islam was spread by a smile. But the, but the truth is, no, it was also spread by the sword, by them going to them, saying either you accept Islam, or you pay the jizya, or you fight. Either one of these three, and this is how Islam was spread. Okay, uh, we come to Andalus, and what was the state of Andalus before the Muslimin took it over? And wallahi, in every single one of these uh, things that we take is a lesson for us. The state of Andalus was that the Romans became very weak in Rome, because obviously they were being attacked by the Muslims, and they had internal problems, internal struggles, and Romans became weak wherever they had, they had their forces. And so the Romans in Europe and, uh, had, were, <coughs> were losing their grip upon Spain. At that time, uh, a tribe by the name of Vandals, they came in from the north and they took over Spain and, the, and, and Andalus at that time. So this is where the word uh, uh, Andalus comes from, basically from the word Vandalus, right? And because they called their land Vandalusia. And you see, they were true to the word. You see, the word Vandals comes from, them, comes from this tribe as well. What does Vandal mean in, uh, in English? What does it mean? Vandal, man, he's a Vandal. What's, what's a Vandal? Yeah, he damages, he pillages. He's a he's a wretched uh, a human being, and he and he's a uh, what is it? He's animalistic, etc. In his behavior, and this is how this tribe were, and that's why they were called vandals, and that's why uh, the description of the, the word English word vandals comes from the, dis the perfect description of this tribe. This is how they were. They were inhuman in their treatment. They were animalistic in their behavior, and they would pillage, and they would conquer, and they would rape, and they would cut up women, and this is how they were. Until at that time, the, 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 a Christian army came from the north uh, by, by the uh, leadership of, uh, of Roderick, and these were the Visigoth, uh, Visigoth uh, uh, Christians that took over uh, Andalus at that time, which is Vandalus at that time. They took over Andalus, uh, Vandalus, and so they were the army and they were the dominant power at the time when the Muslims attacked. And Musa ibn Nasr, we come back to Musa ibn Nasr uh, ibn, ibn Nusayr, who was the Imam in Maghrib. And Maghrib, of course, at that time cons consisted of everything of North Africa Egypt, Tunisia, uh, uh, Algeria, and uh, and, and Morocco. And so all of this was Maghrib in, 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 in the Muslim Empire at that time. So Musa bin Usair, he was a leader and the Khalifa and, and, the, and the representative of the Khalifa at that time. So he decided to think, how am I going to pass the Straits of Gibraltar? How am I going to pass the Straits of Gibraltar, which is approximately 13 miles, miles in distance? So basically, from the highest tip of Africa, which is Septa, until the bottom tip of, uh, of uh, Spain, which is, Mount, which, is, which is the Mount of Gibraltar, is about 13 miles. How is he going to cross this? And then he thought, obviously, the way he's going to cross it is by building ships. So he started to, uh, to, to, to build ships. And he started to ask his, uh, his people, and he set up small harbors in order to build ships. However, it was a difficult task. It was a very, very difficult task because the land at that time was very, very rocky and was not possible to find good places to harbor. But... Because Musa ibn Nusayr was such a righteous man, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala helps his slaves. You see, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, in tansurullah yansurukum. If you help Allah, Allah will help you. So because Musa ibn Nusayr was a helper of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, so Allah helped him. How did Allah help him? Well, in the year uh, 91 after Hijrah, in the year 91, this is the, the year before Andalus is to be conquered. In the year 91 after Hijrah, Julian, who was the leader of Septa, and Septa was, a, was the harbor city, which is the closest thing to 
Spain at, the, at that time, okay, the harbor city which is on, on the top of Africa at that time. Julian, he sent his, his daughter, Julian obviously he was Christian, he sent his daughter to, uh, to Roderick who was the king of Spain at that time in order to, 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 to study with him, in order to study with the monks over, over, at that time uh, over there. However, because she was a very pretty woman, Roderick, he couldn't keep her, keep her hands off her and he raped her. What did he do? He raped her. So Julian got very angry. And he knew that Roderick had to be taught a lesson. But he couldn't do it himself because all he, all he had was a small city. So he sent an emissary to Musa the Nusayr and said, Oh Musa, I will give you the ships. Because obviously he was a harboring city. So he had all the ships that the Muslims needed. I will give you all the ships. And I will give you some armor. And I'll give you X, Y, Z. Everything that he needed. And only thing I want was some lands. He just wanted some lands when Andalus was conquered. And Musa ibn Nusayr, he fell down, prostrating to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This was the victory he was asking for. He was, this was a victory he was asking for. Because the Muslim armies could not at attack Septa because of, of its location. They were not able to take over Septa. So Septa was the only link to really attacking Andalus. And see how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala just gave it to him as a gift. And all this man wanted was some lands. And the Muslims were easy, ha happy to give him lands. It was not lands that they wanted. It was to spread Islam. That is what they wanted. And so... In the year 91, Walid, who was the Khalifa of the Muslims at that time, he told Musa bin Nusayr to not attack in one go, however, to send an, 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 uh, an envoy uh, off to Spain to, to just check out, to see how the territory of Spain is. And so an envoy went and they, and, it, and they checked out Spain and came back and informed Musa bin Nusayr what was the territory and how the terrains were. With that, Musa bin Nusayr, he formed the army of the Muslimin. And this army consisted of the general by the name of Tariq bin Ziyad. The great hero of Islam by the name of Tariq bin Ziyad. Tariq bin Ziyad was blonde. He was white. He had blue eyes. Imagine this. Like for example, Abdurrahim Green being the general for example. Everyone knows Abdurrahim Green. Right? Blonde, white and uh, he doesn't have blue eyes. But then let's say blue eyes. And this is how Tariq bin Ziyad was. The great general of, of, of Islam. And he was a Berber and, and he made his army from the Berbers. And he got on the ships and he went off to Spain uh, and, and, and he landed there. Over there he took over some of the cities, some of the harboring cities and he took over these cities. When he took over these cities, these cities sent an emissary, a messenger to King Roderick who was living in the middle of Spain and who was ruling with Spain and lived in the middle of Spain and he sent um, an, an emissary to King Roderick and said, and this emissary, subhanAllah, it is reported in the books of history that this emissary came to King, to King Roderick and said Oh, oh great king, we are being attacked with a, for, for, uh, for, by a people from the sky. And the king said, what? What do you mean? We are being attacked with a people from the sky. And the king would not understand. So explain yourself, man. What do you mean? And they said, Wallahi, at night they, they, they pray like priests. And in the morning they fight like lions. So they can't be human. They are people from the sky. And Wallahi, this is how the Muslims were. At night they would be beseeching Allah for a victory, praying to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, even though the whole morning they were fighting like lions, fighting from the morning until the night subhanAllah. This is how the Muslim world, this is how they were able to open up the world, this is how we are now so proud nowadays and say subhanAllah, look how great the Muslims were. It was because of this ibadah, of this, this worship of this slave of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, these slaves of Allah who used to be priests at night, whereas they were monks at night, whereas they were subhanAllah, fighters and warriors in the morning. How can the kuffar ever, how will the uh, disbelievers ever succeed? How can they ever succeed against this army? 7,000 in number, so they gathered on the plains uh, 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 in order to fight against the, the forces that King Roderick had amassed. And they heard the Muslims, uh, Tariq bin Ziyad, heard that the Muslims that King Roderick had amassed a huge army, a huge army. He didn't know how much, so he just uh, sent, an, sent a messenger back to Musa bin Usaid in Maghrib and said, Oh Musa, we need some help. So Musa sent 5,000 uh, soldiers, and that's all he could have at that time. So he sent how much? 5,000 soldiers. So the number of Muslim army was at that time how much? 12,000. 12,000. And with that, Tariq bin Ziyad approached the battlefield. Tariq bin Ziyad approached the battlefield. King Roderick, he was very, very haughty and proud. He was a, 
a man who knew, who thought that Allah had guaranteed, who thought that victory was, was a guaranteed, was guaranteed. So he came with his great throne, the people, the peasants and the slaves were carrying his great throne that was studded in jewels and they, and they had the most riches full of gold, a throne made of gold studded with, with, with precious gems. This is how King Roderick came and he, as the historians also narrate that he bought a lot of, lot of donkeys with him. And when he asked, why did you bring all the donkeys? He said, because when we conquer the Muslims, I'm going to take the, uh, uh, tie the slaves to my donkeys and make them roam across my, my, my territories to show them how we are so great and how we have defeated the Muslims and how petty they are. And that's why he actually bought so many donkeys, hundreds and hundreds of donkeys uh, in order to, uh, uh, to, to try and fight the Muslimin. And subhanAllah, because of his kibble, Allah was to give him the lesson of his life. Allah was to give him the lesson of his life. So Tariq bin Ziyad, it has been reported in certain books that when he saw 90,000 or 100,000 Christians in front of him, 100,000 Christians in front of him, what did he do? He told his people to burn the ships. He said to, he told his people to burn the ships. Why? So that people know that there is no way out. There is either victory or death. There is either victory or death. The Muslim historians did not report this event. The Muslim historians don't report this event. It is only the Orientalists who report this event. So we don't know truly whether it is, whether it is a true event or not. And there are some doubts about its authenticity. But whatever, whatever the reason, Tariq bin Ziyad didn't turn back. And the Muslims never turned back. And they pressed on. And they were at the battlefield about to start one of the greatest wars that was ever to be recorded in history. That was ever to be recorded in history. My question to you before uh, I go on to the battle is this question, brothers and sisters in Islam. Which party do you feel sorry for? Which one do you feel sorry for? Do you feel sorry for the Muslims who are 12,000 number or do you feel sorry for the 100,000? 100, 100,000. Why brother, why? Why? That is so illogical, why? <laughs> for surely Allah is with the righteous. So, uh, you know, I, I mean, because I know history and that's what happens so and that's probably why. Oh, mashallah. <laughs> See, you shouldn't have read the history so I could have tested you a little bit. But anyway, alhamdulillah. <coughs> Truly, brothers and sisters of Islam, we don't feel sorry for the Muslims. <laughs> why should we feel sorry for them? Even though they were less in number, they have armies from the heavens coming down to aid them. Whereas these people, they have nothing except their own swords. Wallahi, the Muslims have a Rabbani, an, an Imam, a, a fighter, and a Mujahid, and a, and a pious man leading them, Tariq bin Ziyad, whereas the disbelievers have a haughty king who will lash the people if they do not, if they do not fight. And who will, after the, after the battle, take all the, all the winnings to, for himself. And he has uh, 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 put, put taxes upon the people in order to fund the war. This is how the king was. And they are being led by this king. How can they ever be equal? <laughs> Shall we ever make the mujrimeen, the muslimin like the mujrimeen, like those who are evildoers? <laughs> what is wrong with you that you do not understand? How do you judge? How do you judge? So how can we ever feel pity for the other one? Wallahi, we have 12,000 people here who as Khalid bin Walid rahimahullah had said, جِئْتُكَ بِقَوْمٍ يُحِبُّونَ الْمَوْتَ كَمَا تُحِبُّ الْحَيَاةِ as Khalid bin Walid said about the, about the Muslim warriors, they said, I have come to you with a people who love to die like you love to live. Whereas those people, they love to live and they hate to die. The hundred thousand, they love to live and they hate to die. And the only reason that they brought them there was because their nobles, if they, did, if they didn't bring them, would lash their backs and take their wealth away and, 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 and rape their women if they did not come and fight. This was the only reason they were coming to the battle. So how do you think... How can, how, can, how can the two armies ever be equal? They cannot be equal. That is why Muslims were in a better place, better situation, even though they were 12,000 in number. And so the battle started. Six days it lasted. And on the sixth day, the Muslims won. On the sixth day, the Muslims won. Roderick died. Most of the Christians were, were killed. Most of the Christians in that battle were killed. The sons of Roderick were, were, were killed. Roderick himself fled or he died. And from the Muslims, only a few in number died. Only a few in number died, and Muslimin had the whole of Andalus open to them. Because now the king had fallen. There was nothing left on their way. And so city after city, city after city, Tariq bin Ziyad pressed on until he took over all of Spain. And later on he pushed on, pushed on into parts of Europe as well. In this way, Muslims had taken over all of the city. And the people, what was more interesting was that the people did not rebel.
The people who were there at that, in those cities, the Christians and the Jews, did not rebel because they found the Muslims more trustworthy. They found the Muslims true to their word, whereas these Christian uh, 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 kings were not true to their word. They would always break their treaties. They would always break the treaty, so why would they ever go against the Muslims? They would actually prefer the Muslims to be their leader rather than the non-Muslims. And now I read to you certain things which the uh, historians of, of, the, of the disbelievers have written. I will mention to you what the Muslim historians have written, but just listen to what the, the historians of the disbelievers have written about the greatness of Andalus and how the victory of Tariq bin Ziyad paved the way for a new chapter in civilization. We have Stanley Lane Poole, which is, uh, 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 which is the author of the book, The Moors in Spain. He writes in his introduction, For nearly eight centuries under the, under the Mohammedan rule, Spain set all Europe a shining example of a civilized and enlightened state. Her fertile provinces, rendered d doubly prolific by the industrious engineering skill of the conquerors, and it bore fruit uh, a, a hundredfold. Cities innumerable sprang up in the rich valleys in the Guadavir and the Guandiana, whose names and names only commemorate the vanished glories of the past. To Cordoba belong all the beauty, Cordoba basically, and that's Cordoba. To Cordoba belong all the beauty and ornaments that delight the eye or dazzle the sight. Her long line of sultans form her crown of glory. Her necklace is strung from the pearls which her poets have gathered from the ocean of language. Her dress is the banners of, of learning, well knit together by her men of science and the masters of every art and industry are the hem of her garments. Art, literature and science prospered as they then prospered nowhere else in Europe. Mathematics, astronomy, botany, history, philosophy and jurisprudence were to be mastered in Spain and Spain alone. Whatever makes a kingdom great and prosperous, whatever tends to refinement and civilization was found in Muslim Spain. And we find S.P. Scott in the history of the Moorish Empire in Europe, he writes, Yet there were knowledge and learning everywhere except in Catholic Europe. At a time when even kings could not write or read, a Moorish king, a Moorish basically the Muslim king, a Moorish king had a private library of 600,000 books. At a time when 99% of the Christian people were wholly illiterate, the Moorish city of Cordoba had 800 public schools. And there was not a village within the limits of the empire where the blessings of education could not be enjoyed by the children of the most indigent peasant. And it was difficult to encounter even a Moorish peasant who could not read or write. Unbelievable, isn't it? And they say that we are against education. They say we are against teaching women, subhanAllah. Thompson in his Muslims in Andalusia, he writes, Europe was darkened at sunset. Cordova sh sh shone with public lamps. So when Europe was darkened when at sunset, Cordova shone with public lamps. They actually have public lamps, unbelievable. Europe was dirty, whereas Cordova built a thousand baths. Cordova changed its undergarments daily. People and in Europe lay in the mud. Cordova's streets were paved. Europe's palaces had smoke holes in the ceiling. Cordova's Arabics were exquisite. Europe's nobility could not sign its name. Cordova's children went to school. Europe's monks could not read the baptismal service. It's unbelievable, subhanAllah, when you read about it and the greatness of Spain, and it had left everyone behind, everyone behind, so far ahead, is unbelievable. And Cordova's teachers created a library of Alexandrian dimensions. And these are just, uh, brothers and sisters in Islam, these are just, subhanAllah, uh, glimpses at the greatness of Spain. Glimpses at the greatness of, of, of Spain. Wallahi, subhanAllah, wallahi, if you were to go to Al-Hamra, and these are the palaces of Spain, and you were to go to the to, to the vast gardens that they, that they still try to preserve, you are amazed at the beauty of their creation. You are amazed at how their architecture was so great. You are amazed at how in every single branch of science they had pioneering books which even to now they are, they are preserved as, as evidences of, of, uh, of human achievements. SubhanAllah. Allahu Ta'ala Alam. Allah knows best. However, when Spain was taken from us, it was truly a loss to humanity. When Spain was taken and the Muslims were, were, were thrown out of Spain, truly it was not just a loss to Islam, but it was a loss to humanity. And Muslims and, 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 and humanity itself lost one of its greatest assets, and these were the Muslims. And this is what the world has lost, has lost by the downfall of Muslims. They have lost a lot of honor, they have lost knowledge, they have lost 
greatness in every single field. They have lost masters in every single field. They have lost a lot of respect. As we will take inshallah in the next lesson, you will see how the world has truly fallen apart after the coming of of, uh, of the Christians into Spain. How, wallahi, when the Christians when the Christians threw out Muslims in large numbers and they pillaged Muslims and they raped hundred thousand women and they and they killed millions of, 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 of Muslimin. How when they actually did that and they actually banished millions of Muslims away from Spain, wallahi victory was not for anyone except for the Muslims and 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 defeat was for no one except except for the Christians. Because truly when the Muslims left Spain, Spain ceased to be the leader of the world. Spain ceased to be leaders of the world. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best until the next session. Uh, brothers and sisters in Islam, I will start off our talk on the fall of Andalus by quoting to you what many of the historians and how they have described how pitiful was the state of Andalus, how pitiful was the state of the world when Andalus fell. And I will quote to you what this man, Stanley Lane Poole, uh, he writes in the Moors in Spain, and he is actually a very uh, non-biased uh, writer. And so if you want to go back to his book, this is actually quite a fine non-biased book, and that is Stan Stanley uh, Lane Poole's the, the Moors in Spain. He writes, with, with Granada fell all Spain's greatness. For a brief while, indeed, the reflection of the Moorish splendor cast a borrowed light upon the history of the land, which it, which it had once warmed with its sunny radiance. The great epoch of, of Isabella, Charles V, and Philip II of Columbus, Cortes, and Pizarro shed a last uh, halo about the dying monuments of a mighty state. When followed the, uh, the abomination of dissolution, the rule of inquisition, and the blackness of darkness in which Spain has been plunged ever since. In the land where science was once supreme, the Spanish doctors became noted for nothing but their ignorance and incap uh, incapacity. The arts of Toledo and Almeria faced into, uh, 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 faded into insignificance. The land deprived of skillful irrigation of the moors grew impoverished and neglected. The richest and the most fertile valleys languished and were deserted, and most of the popular cities which had filled every district in Andalusia fell into ruinous decay and beggars, frayers and bandits to the place of scholars, merchants and knights. So low fell Spain when she had driven away the moors. Such is the melancholy of the contrast offered by her history. And also uh, 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 Prescott writes as well in his Philip the Two of Spain, he writes, The Arabs suddenly appeared in Spain like a star which crosses through the air with its lights, uh, spreads its flame on the horizon and then vanishes rapidly into naught. They appeared in Spain to fill her suddenly with their activity and the fruit of their genius and endowed her with a glorious glamour which, uh, which enveloped her from the Pyrenees to Gibraltar and from the oceans to the Barcelona. But a, burning, but a burning love for liberty and independence, a fickle character, dispose of frivolity and merriness, neglect of old virtues, an unfortunate disposition of revolution, provoked always by an inflamed imagination, violent passions and ambitions, a spirit to dominate and other factors of decay, worked in the course of time to, to demolish this great edifice raised by men like Tariq, Abdurrahman al-Nasr, Muhammad ibn al-Ahmar, and led the Arabs to internal dissension, which sapped their power and pushed them away to the abysses of Nott. Millions of Moors quitted Spain, carrying their property and arts. The patrimony of a, Spain, of a state, what have the Spaniards created in their place? We could say nothing but an eternal sorrow fills this land, in which the gayest natures breath before. Indeed, there are some ruined monuments which still look like these gloomy districts, but a real cry resounds from the depths of these monuments and ruins. Honor and glory to the conquered Moor, and decay and misery to the victorious Spaniard. Subhanallah. As well, uh, uh, Kamen, Mr. K uh, Dr. Kamen, he writes in the in Spanish Inquisition, as a result of his Cardinal Zimin's uh, coercive end uh, endeavors, it is reported that on the 18th December 1499, about 3,000 Moors were baptized by him, and a leading mosque in Granada was converted into a church. Converts were encouraged to, to surrender their Islamic books, several thousand of which were destroyed by Zemins in a public bonfire. A few rare books of medicine were kept aside for the University, university of Alcala. Uh, Zemins claimed the Moors had forfeited all their rights under the terms of, 
of uh, Granada. They should therefore be given the choice between baptism and expulsion. At Anderax, the principal mosque in which the women and children had taken refuge was blown up with gunpowder. All books in Arabic, especially the Quran, were collected to be burnt. Cardinal Zames was reported during his conversion campaign during, amongst the Granada Moors uh, in 1500 to have burnt in the public square of Virambra over, over 1,005,000 volumes, including unique works of Moorish culture. SubhanAllah. And these are books which the scholars have written over centuries being burnt in front of our eyes. And this is how, SubhanAllah, uh, uh, Spain had, had, had uh, been destroyed after the coming of the Christians. Brothers and sisters in Islam, what was the reason for the downfall of Spain? What was the reason for the downfall of Spain? The reason for the downfall of Muslims in Spain was of course for a number of reasons. The first of which was that in the people there was true lack of Iman. People had become fascinated with beauty, with this worldly life, and they were into luxury in a way that you just cannot even describe. They were into luxury more than we, we are into luxury, subhanAllah. They were into big palaces, they were the leaders of the world, and so they had this pride in their heart, and they were into luxury like you cannot describe. They used to write poems about how beautiful the, the, the Spaniard women were at that time, about, about red, uh, uh, red hair and green eyes. And this is what filled the, their books, uh, their, them fantasizing about beautiful women. And this is subhanAllah, a sign of how they were so taken away from, from, from the women of this world, uh, taken away from the women of the hereafter to the women of this world. SubhanAllah. Truly the uh, level of Iman in their hearts had truly de declined. No more was, was a prayer a, a, a means of, 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 of peace, attaining peace. Rather, rather the prayer was a burden upon them. It was a cultural practice that they were doing. No more was gaining Islamic knowledge a obligation, rather it was, uh, uh, it was what the philosophers would uh, at that time in Andalus would call a waste of time. A waste of time because true, true knowledge was the knowledge of philosophy that the philosophers were, were uh, uh, philosophizing at that time. Also of course, brothers and sisters in Islam, it was truly the fact that there was a lot of cowards in, that, in, in, in Andalus. Many of the kings of Andalus were true cowards. They were just cowardice and there is no other word that you can use to describe them. They were, they, they were in, the, in the face of danger they would leave. In the face of danger they would give up their empire. In the face of danger they would just make pacts with the, with the Christians and the Christians were completely treacherous in the way that they would look after their, their pacts. And so people were cowards, were true cowards. On top of that brothers and sisters in Islam, people were traitors as well to Muslims. A Muslim would help a disbeliever over his Muslim brother. Something which the ulama of Islam have complete consensus that it is complete kufr. To help, your Mus to, to help a disbeliever over a Muslim, over a Muslim uh, and, and to take over the lands and to rape the women and, for, and to help the disbelievers to take Muslim women as, as, their, as their concubines and slaves. It's unbelievable, you know, this is all what happened in, in, in Spain. It is truly a tragic, a tragic history, a, um, a journey into a, a very, very tragic history, how these traitors, these Muslim uh, rulers at that time were such traitors of Muslimin that, that they would actually help Christians, crusaders who they knew were treacherous to their packs, who, who, they would, who, knew, who they knew would automatically break, their, break their, their, their packs. All why? Because they just couldn't be bothered trying to, to, to fight them. They just couldn't be bothered. They would rather let the, the disbelievers fight their, their brothers and help them with, with whatever uh, they, they required. And because there was so much into, into the dunya. As we will come to subhanAllah, one of the greatest uh, and the, uh, one of the most treacherous rulers of Spain was Ibn al Ahmar. And, and let us take the history of Spain from 250 years before its fall and we'll see how all of these things uh, that I have mentioned to you are described in the history of Spain. And I, will, I will start off with, uh, uh, with 643 after Hijrah, that is approximately 255 years before the, the fall of Spain. In, in Spain we have different rulers at that time. 643 after Hijrah, Spain has been broken up into different rulers. The Muslims are being ruled by different rulers. Garnata has a ruler and, and, and Seville has a ruler and so every major city in, in, over, over there at that time has different rulers. Why? Because they just couldn't be together, they couldn't keep, uh, the, 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 the rulers at that time had too much love for power and so they broke, so they broke up. So we have this man by the name of 
Ibn al-Ahmar. Ibn al-Ahmar, this is just a laqab, this is just a title that was put for him. His father was not al-Ahmar. He himself had very red skin. And that's why they used to call him al-Ahmar. Ibn al-Ahmar, the son of the red man. And he himself was a red, uh, who was reddish in color. And he was the ruler of Garnata in the year 643 after Hijra. This man, he made a pact with Fernandes III, who was a ruler of uh, of, uh, of of uh, Seti- Seti- Setia at that time, excuse me, <coughs> Setia at that time, and he made a pact with him upon four things. The ruler of uh, of Setia at that time, Fernandes the Third, he made a pact with uh, 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 Ibn al-Ahmar upon four things. The first thing was that he would pay jizya to the Christian, <laughs> that the Muslim would pay jizya to who, to the Christian. The second thing he said was that he would not fight him ever. So jihad was forbidden against the Christians. Right? Imagine this. Wallahi, this is how we will be applying them to our current situation as well. Aren't we paying jizya to the disbelievers now? Yes or no, guys? We are, but of course we call it something else. We call it, what do we call it? We call it uh, debt. We call it servicing the debt. We call it... Uh, subhanallah, helping them with the with the cost of the battles that they've fought on our on our behalf. You know, Subhanallah. But this is jizya, isn't it? At least those Muslims in Andalusia, they were at least you know uh, uh, honest enough to to own up that they're actually paying the jizya to the Christians. Okay, so jizya they would pay, and so jihad against against those crusaders of the uh, uh, of the army of Fernandez was 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 forbidden. And also the third thing with that was that Al Ahmar would give up a lot of his land. And the last thing was that. Al Ahmar would he, would use his Muslim armies, his Moorish armies, in order to attack uh, whatever enemy uh, that Fernandez decided to, uh, whatever place Fernandez decided to attack. And what do you think Fernandez attacked the first? He attacked the Muslims, obviously. Who would he attack? He wouldn't attack the Christians. So the first person he at, at, attacked after he made this pact with the with the leader of Ganata was that he attacked Seville, which was a Muslim uh, uh, city at that time, which is in Arabic known as Al-Ashbiliya. Ashbiliya was a place that he attacked the first. Ashbiliya was the first place that he attacked. And the armies that actually uh, made, uh, laid a siege to Al-Ashbiliya were the Muslim armies, b- uh, led by Al-Ahmar. So Al-Ahmar was attacking his own brothers, his own Muslim brothers, in order to help their Christian friend against his Muslim brother. And he laid a siege for 15 months, until Asbiliya gave up, and then they went in, they raped the women, they killed the men, they killed children, and they, uh, they, uh, they told the people to leave the city. They, they told the Muslims who were there to leave the, leave the city, there were 400,000 in number. They banished 400,000 Muslims. And these Muslims, of course, went, went back to, to Morocco, or basically went back to Maghrib because they had nowhere else to go. Look at this. What is amazing, brothers and sisters in Islam, is not only did Ibn Ahmar attack his own Muslim brothers, but also his army. His army. Yani, alayhi safikum rajulun rashid. Isn't there, a, isn't there a righteous man amongst them? Isn't there a righteous man amongst them? It was his army. How could he attack if his army didn't want to, want, want to attack? But he and his army, all of them attacked. Subhanallah. So not only was he corrupt, but also he was corrupt. You see, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in the Quran, and He says, In Allah la yugayyur ma bi qawmin hatta yugayyur ma bi anfusihim. Verily, Allah does not change the state of a person until they change their own state. So Allah, Allah did not say over here that Allah will not change the situation of, of, the, of the believers or of the Muslims until they change the hukam. No, Allah said until they change themselves. So wallahi, because they were bad, their hukam was also bad. Because the people were bad, their hukam was also bad. And because we are Muslimin are so low in our iman, and if you look at the umum al-Muslimin, the general Muslimin, that is why our rulers are also the same. You can't expect them to be better. If we were better, then wallahi, our rulers would be better. But because we are so low in our iman, we have left, left our religion so much, that is why our rulers are also the same. And that is why... Ibn al-Ahmar was no better than the people who he was leading. Uh, until Ibn, uh, al-Khatib, al-Baghdad, uh, al-Khatib al-Baghdadi, rahimahullah, he mentions in, an, in Tariq al-Baghdad, that the people of Garnat at that time, even though they were the leaders of the world at that time, they had started to imitate the Christians. So the, so the Muslim armies in Garnata, who was led by Ibn al-Ahmar, they used to wear their armor in the same way the Christians used to wear. The women in, their, in, their, in, in, the, in Garnata used to wear their hair in the same way the Christian women used to wear their hair. And it was truly amazing. People started to 
resemble the disbelievers little by li- little by little and so obviously when you resemble them outwardly then your inner heart also resembles them and this is exactly what was happening with the muslims when they were outwardly resembling the, the, the kuffar then truly that that which was in their heart as well was 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 resembling that which was with the disbelievers so we find therefore <coughs> that uh, uh, truly Ibn Ahmar was a uh, was a, a, a truly evil man and he took over Aspiliya in the name of the cross and he uh, uh, killed Muslimin and he drove uh, he killed lots of lots of Muslims he killed them and the main mosque subhanallah the main mosque in Aspiliya he, he is the one who erected a cross there he actually erected a cross there in uh, in answer to his crusader masters answering the call of his crusader masters he turned the main mosque in Aspiliya into a church, and this is Muslimin doing it, isn't it? Well, of course, this is enough for uh, for, for anyone to know that uh, Ibn Ahmad was not a Muslim. Thereafter, uh, uh, one important point that we need to know, brothers and sisters in Islam, is that Ibn Ahmad, the reason why he was doing all of this is that he was too busy to worry about fighting. He would rather not fight the Crusaders. Uh, he would rather spend his time building beautiful jannat and beautiful palaces. And, and in his time, actually, Al 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 Hamra was built, as you know, Al Al Hamra, which is the great palace in Garnata, <coughs> which is a great palace and an example of magnificent uh, architectural wonder. It is truly deserves to be one of the great wonders of the world. And it is so beautiful and so great. Wallahi, I, have, I remember some of our teachers who had gone there and they had uh, pi- pictured it and, and, and taken uh, pictures of it. Wallahi, I, t- I saw you know, eyes in the eyes of my te- uh, you know, tears in the eyes of our teachers. And they were crying when they saw how beautiful Garnata was and how stupid and how silly we Muslims were to have actually uh, uh, let such a beautiful prize pass by us. How we could have let such a beautiful prize, which is a Jannah on this earth, pass by us. And at that time it was reported that Ibn Ahmad was too busy building uh, uh, gardens. And in, in his time, whilst the Muslims were being attacked, and whilst he was sending his armies in order to help the other uh, disbelievers against other Muslimin, he was busy building libraries, and he was busy building mosques. And he, you know, obviously, mosques at that time were not really properly really used as mosques. They were, uh, you know, splendid displays of architectural wonder. He was busy building Jannat, as they used to call every garden of Jannah, because of how beautiful they were. They would actually dig up canals, dig up rivers, man-made rivers that would flow through the flow through the uh, flow through these Jannat in order to beautify it, and they would subhanallah make man-made islands inside these these rivers in order to beautify. It. Can you imagine what he was doing? He was busy doing this, and in his time, he whilst the Muslims were being attacked, he he built three hundred like, uh, like these of these. Uh, uh, Jannat 300 gardens you don't need 300 how many do you need how many do you need will he ever visit them in his life <clears throat> and he built 300 whilst the Muslims were in such a state we come to seven uh, in the year 671 after Hijrah and at that time the king Fernandez III had died and he had given uh, given his place to Alfonso X and Alfonso he was a very very evil man and he would constantly be- break the break the treaties as you know the crusaders as you will notice throughout our 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 lecture today you will notice that the christians always broke their broke the treaties they would always constantly break the treaties and the muslims were were silly enough uh, to not even realize that they were breaking the treaties and they would make a pact again and in that pact they would say you have to give us x number of land and they would give him and then again they would break the treaties and uh, break the treaty in order to make another treaty again and in this way continues subhanallah for a number of years until we come to the year 671 in which alfonso the 10th he was uh, 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 an, an animal uh, uh, he was an animal in his behavior and he would totally kill everybody and he would openly break the, break the packs without any, uh, without any uh, uh, thought. And he was not political like, like, the, like his predecessor, but he was more rude and hamajiyah or, 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 or true ravage, uh, true savage. Ibn Ahmad at that time, he knew that he couldn't last against Alfonso X. And so he sent for an emissary to uh, to Morocco at the time, and Morocco was being ruled by this by by the Imam, the great Imam, the great Mujahid, the great hero of Islam, Yaqub ibn Mansur al Marini. Yaqub ibn Mansur, Abi Yusuf, Yaqub ibn Mansur al Marini, and Yaqub ibn Mansur al Marini was, Subhanallah, the ulama have described him with with things well, bef- that, that truly de- uh, describe how this person was the Baqiyat al-Salaf. He was like the uh, remnants of the Salaf. 
and they used to describe him that he was kathir as sawm he used to fast a lot and he used to pray a lot and he was always doing dhikr and he was extremely kind to the poor and he used to love the ulama and he never lost a battle any battle that he ever fought he would always win never attack a city except that he won he was a khatib he was an imam he was a faqih they would describe him uh, as as a person who would pray all night and fight all day he was a mujahid in the morning and he was a abid at night subhanallah truly a leader so when Yaqub in the Mansur Marini when he got a note asking for help from his Muslim brother in Andalus little does he know that this person is such a big big traitor and a serpent uh, uh, he obviously as every Muslim brother would do go to his aid so he uh, organized his army of only 5,000 men and he went off to Spain so he left Maghrib and he went up and he went up to Spain when he reached Spain he had a major war he called for a major war and he had a major war with the Christians at that time and the Christians obviously at that time were a 90,000 in, in number whereas he was only 5,000 and, and another 5,000 from the army uh, armies of Granada and over there Yaqub in the Mansur al-Marini he had given a beautiful speech which wallahi I wanted to uh, share with you uh, from his great beauty however wallahi I don't think I can do justice to how, how beautiful his speech was he said ala wa inna al-jannata qad iqtarab uh, or, or is it not that the Jannah has, has come near and the whores and the, and the women of paradise have worn their best dresses they are ready to get married to their, to their husbands and the rivers have started to flow faster for in anticipation of those people who will drink for it and the, uh, and the, and the tents of paradise and its, and, its pearl, uh, and, and its pearly tents have become open and the Jannah is calling out to you asking you, begging you to come and take its place and will you not answer the call and so wallahi he gave such a beautiful talk to the people and the people all decided to uh, hug each other and wear their uh, last clothes in order to as, as you know they were all ready to die in the cause of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala it so happened that only 500 or 600 of the Muslims died in that battle However, most of the Christians died of the 90,000 against 10,000 most of the Christians died again subhanAllah Kam min fi'atin qalilatin. how many small armies have have overcome larger armies bi-idhnillah by the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Wallahi when Umar got a, a, a note of uh, asking for help from his commanders he used to write back to them Wallahi I am not going to send you any madad I am not going to send you any help however I will send you this piece of advice you will win not because of numbers but by Wallahi you will win because of taqwa you are your greatest enemy he used to write, you are your greatest enemy. Your sins are the reasons for your loss, not because of loss of numbers. Wallahi, and this is so true. So true, we find yet again and again in the history of Andalus and the history of, of a Muslim world, how so many few in number would take over large, large quantities of people. Why? Because of the strength of their iman. Because wallahi, they would love to die as we love to live today. And wallahi, subhanAllah, you know, Yani, what can I say, Wallahi, akhi, you know, I'm, I'm at a loss to describe how we have become so, uh, so useless as Rasulullah had said that, Wallahi, we will not be less in number, we will be huge, we will be large. SubhanAllah, we are so large in number that even a wave that came a, a couple of days ago, you know, in the tsunami disaster, and even though it wiped out 200,000 people, Wallahi, we still have a large number. We still have such a large number. So we are large in number, wallahi, but we are ghutha, ka ghutha is saying, we are like the form of the ocean. And wallahi, Rasulullah could not have found a better description for us. Because we are like this form that even the ocean hits. When you know the ocean hits, and still the form doesn't do anything, and the form only increases the number. And when the shaitan and the enemy hits us, and the enemy hits us, we do nothing, and we are like that form that just increases the number, useless to the ummah, useless to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, useless to ourselves. We can't even defend ourselves to defend anyone else subhanallah in the year 673 is the, is the time in which uh, uh, Yaqub the Mansur al-Marini attacked the Christians and he took over and he defeated them so when he defeated them he attacked after that he attacked uh, Seville which was uh, Asbili at that time he attacked uh, Asbili and it, remember Asbili was the town that Ibn al-Ahmar uh, 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 you know, destroyed, wasn't it? And he helped the Christians take over. So he took over Aspilia. <laughs> Thereafter, he, he helped uh, uh, fortify Garnata and he left Garnata to Ibn al Ahmar and he went back. He left Garnata and he went back, uh, 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 he left Garnata uh, and he went back to 
uh, to uh, Morocco uh, to uh, Maghrib. Thereafter, uh, in the year uh, 673, uh, Ibn al-Ahmar uh, uh, died, and Ibn al-Ahmar had a son by the name of Muhammad ibn al-Ahmar, and Muhammad ibn al-Ahmar was called the Faqih. <laughs> he was called what al faqih but wallahi ma kana bi faqih he was not faqih at all wallahi rather he was a jahil ignorant man he was a jahil ignorant man they used to say wallahi is kathir al dhikr kathir al tafakkur but he was kathir al tafakkur kathir you know a lot of thought he used to think a lot and 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 uh, and uh, you know remember allah a lot but wallahi he would only think about how to uh, uh, be a traitor against his Muslim brothers, as you will see uh, what happened. When, when Yaqub the Mansul Marini was becoming so successful, Al- Al-Faqih, this man, he became very jealous. He became what? He became very jealous. So he went to the king of Castile at that time, and he asked the king to help him to attack who? Yaqub the Mansur Al-Marini. He, <laughs> he went to his disbelieving friend, and he asked him, oh my dear friend, won't you help me attack my so-called brother in Islam? And subhanAllah, the king would gladly help him to attack his Muslim brother. So when, when Yaqub Mansur al-Marini heard about this, he came back in a hurry. And when he came back in a hurry uh, uh, to, uh, to Spain again, obviously he was in Maghrib, he came back in a hurry. When he came back in a hurry and the, and the Muslim armies were there on the battlefield, the Christian army actually ran away. When they saw Yaqub Mansur Marini, they never, they, they never forgot him. Because only a couple of years ago, they had fought him and, they, and Yaqub Mansur Marini had destroyed them. So, Wallahi, it is as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had said, uh, uh, Rasulullah s.a.w. had said, Usirtu bil ru'bi masirat al-shahr. I have been aided with the fear in the hearts of the people, the distance of a month's travel. Even before Yaqub Mansur Marini was, was coming, people were whispering to each other, Yaqub is coming, Yaqub is coming. What is going to happen? And of course, when they saw him, that's it, they went. They would rather save their lives rather than die at the, die at the sword in the, on the battlefield. Ob- obviously, when the Christians ran away and the Christian king ran away as well, what was left? Al-Faqih was left. And so Al-Faqih started to make excuses. He came to Yaqub the Mansur al-Marini and said, Wallahi, you know, I was pressured into this and that. And Wallahi, you know, started to make excuses. And this great Imam, this great Abid, he forgave him. He forgave Al-Faqih, and not only that, he left all the lands and gave it to Faqih as a gift. And said, just because you have repented as well, all the lands that the Muslim armies from Morocco had conquered, this is for you as well, as a gift. And it's tremendous, the, the karam and the kindness of this man, Yaqub Mansur Marini, was truly tremendous, and he, and he left that. When we come to the year 685 after Hijrah, at that, uh, in that year, uh, Yaqub Mansur Marini, rahimullah, he died in the year 685 and he was uh, 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 replaced by his son Yusuf ibn Yaqub ibn Mansur al-Marini Yusuf this man Yusuf Yusuf was not as strong as as his father however he was also also a righteous man he was not as uh, uh, as much as a fighter and a a knight like his father but but still he was a righteous man and when Faqih when Al-Faqih this guy Al-Faqih when he saw that Yusuf the Mansur al-Marini had died what do you think he did? tell me what do you think he did? he went again to the king of, of, uh, of Castilia, he went to them and said, help me against, uh, against the son Yusuf. Subhanallah, he goes back to his old ways. Truly this man hasn't repented to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He goes back to his old ways. Wallahi, you know when you read about this, it is as if you're reading the biographies of some of our rulers today. It is unbelievable, <coughs> isn't it? It is unbe- unbelievable truly how they betrayed their brothers, even though their brothers had, had so kindly forgiven them. Of course, what was the hukum in Islam for, for al-Faqih when he, when he was actually attacking the Muslims with the, and aiding with the Christians? What was the hukum of Islam? Kill, isn't it? The hukum of Islam for such, such a traitor was to be put to death. However, Yaqub the Mansur al-Marini, when he had forgiven him, he never thought that he was going to do this uh, thing again. Which silly person does that again, except a disbeliever? And so, that is what al-Faqih did. And he went against Yasuf, uh, Yusuf al-Marini. And what happened was, in, in, in the year uh, uh, 701, uh, al-Faqih died and he was replaced by al-Amash. Uh, his son called Al-A'mash and this son Al-A'mash he aided the Christians in taking over the Straits of Gibraltar 
So now the Christians ruled over the Straits of Gibraltar, making sure that therefore the, the help that would come from Maghrib, from the bottom, would not reach Andalus anymore. Meaning that that would be the end of the help that would ever come from Morocco and, 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 and Maghrib to ever help the Muslims in Spain. As you know, subhanAllah, you know, the, the people of Maghrib had a great hand in making sure the Muslims in Spain were together and they prospered. However, it was when uh, they actually cut off the Madad at completely and they fortified the castles against the Muslim help coming from Morocco, then truly, wallahi subhanAllah, uh, that was the end of, they had sealed their faith basically. Andalus, their, their, fa their fate was, was sealed. So we come about, uh, about 160 years later. We come to the year 871, which is 871, which is about 26 years before the, the end of Andalus. Before the end of Andalus. And throughout this time, about 160 years, uh, the Muslims had, was, was still led by very weak, weak rulers. And they were always fighting each other and breaking up. And the reason why the Christians couldn't uh, attack them and take over the Muslims was because the Christians themselves were divided. So all throughout this time, the Christians themselves were divided for 160 years. Yet in the years 871, uh, the queen of, of, uh, of, uh, of, of, the, of the Christians, that Isabel, her name was, uh, of, uh, the, the queen of uh, uh, Castilia, Isabel, and the king of Aragon, they decided to get married. And what's the problem when people get married? There's no problem, is there? But the problem here was that because two kingdoms were coming together, the Christians were not divided anymore, and because they were married now, and they would get married, and then and, uh, and and so the forces of the Christians would be united now against the against the Muslims, and this truly was the end of of Andalus because uh, Queen Isabella he made she made a promise that she would not sleep with the king King Aragon until uh, until they had taken over the palaces of of of, of Ogarnata and that you would they, and they would only sleep together in the palaces of the Muslims. Subhanallah, this is the promise, this is the oath that she, that she took upon herself. And so obviously the king would want to sleep with his bride. And so he rallies his armies together in order to attack the Muslims. At that time the Muslims were, were being ruled by two sons of, of, of the Khalifa. The Muslims at that time were, were ruled by this person by the name of Al-Ghalib Billah. Al-Ghalib Billah meaning the person who, is, uh, who uh, wins, what is a better word for Al-Ghalib? Uh, the, the person who wins by the by the by the fortune or the good fortune of Allah subhanahu wa taala, and by another man by the name of Adhagal, and he was his brother Adhagal. Adhagal basically means uh, a, a courageous person. Obviously, they were never courageous. Any huge titles, mashallah, you know, like we have today in a custodian, etc., and this and that. We have huge titles, but Allah, they have very very little meaning. Yeah. The empty meaning, but they're huge titles, mashallah. And the titles are bigger than the people themselves, subhanAllah. And uh, Al Ghalib Billah, they, uh, Al Ghalib Billah and Al Dhaghal, they were fighting each other. And later on, alhamdulillah, they, they agreed to calm down their fighting. However, they decided to break up Garnata, which was the biggest city at that time. The, the, the pride of Spain, Muslim Spain at the time, they decided to break it up between themselves. So Al, Al Ghalib Billah took half of Spain, half of uh, 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 Garnata, essentially taking half of Spain with him. Half for whatever was left from, from the Muslim Spain at that time, whereas the uh, took over the other half. So what happened was Al-Ghalib Billah, he had a wife and he had a concubine that, uh, that he had. His wife was a Muslim uh, a woman by the name of Aisha, and he had a son with that with, with Aisha by the name of As-Saghir. And Wallahi, he was As-Saghir. He was called as saghir and Wallahi, he was Saghir. As you will see, he is the person who handed over Spain to the Kuffar without even raising a single finger, as you will come to, inshallah. He was true Truly a sagir. Whereas Al Ghalib Billah, he slept with uh, obviously he slept with his concubine, and he had a a son from her. Uh, she was a she was a Christian concubine, Christian woman, and uh, and she was actually Ghalib Billah used to write poems about how he was so overtaken by her beauty and, and her char her charm. And it was later on found, of course, this co this Christian concubine was sent as a spy and as a uh, infiltrator to try and charm the the Khalifa into giving over Granada to the Christians. So. Uh, she had a he had a he had a child with this with this Christian concubine, and uh, and this child was uh, his name was Abu Abdullah obviously a Muslim, he, and but yet obviously from a Christian concubine the people would never accept him as the leader over over Spain. However, uh, the Christian concubine because she would she would always uh, uh, you know convince him. To, uh, she, she had a, a stronghold in Ghalib Billah on the on the Caliph Ghalib Billah. She convinced him to actually put Aisha and her son al-Saghir into, a, into a, a, a tower 
in, and lock them in the tower whereas uh, and, and to make her son which was uh, uh, Abu Abdullah make him the leader over the Muslims in Garnata and this is what he did however of course the Muslims never wanted a man who was born of a Christian woman and who did not even accept Islam uh, Muslims would never accept such a person as a leader and so they had a civil revolution they had a revolution at that time and until which uh, after which they actually got out as Sagir and they made as Sagir the, 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 the ruler over over Spain and as Sagir as well he killed his he, he, he banished his father Al Ghalib Billah and he took over uh, the other part of Garnata which was with uh, al Dagal and so as Sagir therefore united Garnata before the final handover to the Christians. In the year nineteen in the year uh, uh, 896 after Hijra, the year before Andalus was to fall forever. In, the, in that year, the Christians decided to gather their forces and fight fight as Sagir. And as you know, Sagir, he was over Garnata, the last king over Garnata, and he was the one who uh, uh, was, was the final thorn in the throat of the Crusaders. And as Sagir, uh, Wallahi, he, he didn't want to fight them, but then after asking all his counsel, he decided that there was no way out except to fight the Crusaders. At that time, a Mujahid by the name of Musa al Ghassan, Rahimahullah, he rallied the people, just like Shaykh Hussain Taymiyyah did at the time of when, when the Tatars were, were attacking. SubhanAllah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent this man, Musa al Ghassan, to rally the people, and he rallied the people and made them want to fight, 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 uh, fight the Crusaders and defended off the Crusaders for seven months. For how many months? for six to seven months. Thereafter, the king and queen of uh, uh, the uh, Queen Isabella and her, and her husband for Aragon, they sent an emissary to us, to us Sagir and said, uh, we will give you 70 conditions, we, we will do 70 things for you with the condition that you hand over Granada to us uh, uh, um, and, and, give, and give Granada to us. And from these conditions were that, we, that we will not harm you, we will not harm your, your children, we will not harm your family, and you know things like that, all guaranteeing the king that he was going to be safe. And we will give you X number of uh, uh, wives and concubines, and we will give you so much money, and this and that, subhanAllah. And this man, as Sagir, he thought that, subhanAllah, this is a good deal. <laughs> he thought that this is a good deal because he doesn't. He didn't have faith in in the Muslim power. He didn't have faith in the fact that Muslims could uh, defend their lands, and so he he thought that this is a good deal. Let me just sell myself off. But then he made two conditions, and look at these conditions of a coward. The conditions of a coward. He said that the king and the queen have to come and swear by Allah, <laughs> swear by God that these conditions are true. And you know the Christians obviously say what a stupid condition, you know, as if we're gonna, as if we care. And so they did it, you know, they they agreed to this condition. And the second condition is that the Pope has to be uh, our leader in affairs, and that the Pope has to agree to these conditions. And so you know the Pope's final. How can you take someone? It's like taking you know United Nations as our leader, isn't it? Between our affairs. See how. <laughs> it is happening all the time. He's taking the Pope, subhanAllah, as the guardian in, in case of disputes. If, if, for example, the Christian just doesn't fill up what, fulfill one of these conditions, he's going to go to the Pope. <laughs> in that manner, subhanAllah. And this is so amazing. This is, these are the two conditions. When, uh, when uh, uh, the Mujahid Musa al-Nasr, Musa al-Ghassan, when he saw these conditions, he gave a khutbah to the people and told the people, Wallahi, this is a end to your schools, this, this is an end to your mosques, this is an end to Islam in, in Garnata, you must, not, you must not agree, but then the people agreed, and, 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 and as Sagir agreed, of course Musa al Nasr, he had a small band of, of men, he did not agree, and he said, Wallahi, I will, I will prefer death rather than, uh, rather than uh, slavery to the, to the Christians, and so obviously he put on his armor and he went out and fought in what we, what we call suicide missions, these days and he went and fought until he died subhanAllah and this was with, with his death with, with, with his death the death of Musa uh, Musa al-Ghassan died the Islamic fervor the, 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 the desire to defend Andalus and with that uh, as sagir handed over he, he went off to the, to the king and queen to hand over the keys of Garnata to them whilst he was passing by the beautiful palaces whilst he was passing by the beautiful, beautiful palaces of Spain and the beautiful gardens, you know, these are valleys and valleys, not just one, one or two. These are valleys of the most exquisite uh, uh, architecture and most exquisite wonders in the world. And he, when he was passing by and he was taking his mother with him, uh, the, the historians narrate that his beard was filled with tears and he was crying. And so his mother told him something very, very important. He told him, you are crying like a woman when you could not defend your city like a man. 
saying, A'udhu Billah, yani what a way to truly describe a coward and a traitor and a person who had absolutely no, no honor and no bravery in his heart. You were crying like a man first of all and you were also uh, were, were, uh, were so small that you could not defend your city like a man. Subhanallah. And this is truly what describes the, the, the fall of Andalus. The reason why we truly let Andalus go was that we cry like women, we forget that we are true men and because we, could, we cannot defend our cities like true men. Subhanallah. This is truly the reason of, for, the, for the fall of Andalus. That the dunya had, had uh, subhanallah, had filled us up. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, وَإِذَا أَرَدْنَا نُهْلِكَ قَرْيَةً فَأَمَرْنَا مُتْرَفِيهَا فَفَسَقُوا فِيهَا فَحَقَّ عَلَيْهَا الْقَوْلَ فَدَمَّرْنَاهَا تَدْمِيرًا As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to destroy a nation, then He uh, orders مُتْرَفِيهَا And مُتْرَفِيهَا as Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu mentioned, is that we ordered the people or we allowed the people to, be in, to indulge in luxury, for them to indulge in luxury and matters of this world, such that when they are so delved, you know, dwelling, dwelling in it, and they're immersed in this luxury and love of this world, world, then because of that we punish them so we destroy them with a the complete destruction and this is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in the Quran that truly wallahi it is because we have wahan in our heart and, and hope, hope for the dunya wahan is the fear of death and, and love for this life truly this was the reason why we had lost some of the greatest uh, you know treasures of this world the greatest prize that we could ever earn we have ever earned in this world and that was the Andalus that that was Allahumma stand. Uh, I I urge my brothers and sisters in Islam to think about the history of Andalus and how Subhanallah we were always betrayed. Uh, we always betrayed ourselves. Why we always let ourselves down? Why Wallahi, you know the, the disbelievers can never beat us because we're always stronger. They can never beat us. It is the enemy inside. It is the enemy inside. We are our greatest enemy, and that is why truly we lost Andalus because we could not control the enemy inside. If we could control the enemy inside, then truly we would win in this life and the hereafter as well. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdik. Ashhadu wa illa illa anta astaghfiruka wa tawbi ilayk.